podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Welcome to the Ospreys Irie. Hello and welcome back to the Ospreys Irie podcast, the podcast who in this situation will be uh, Switzerland and will remain neutral in everything. Uh, more on that later. Uh, it is me, James, uh, as always, joined by the boys, Yestin and Robbie. How are we? Yeah, I'm, I'm all okay. Um, a bit, of a, bit of a poor day for myself yesterday, but that's a completely different story. But but yeah, I'm, I'm all right. I'm still here. And uh, there's a lot of things to talk about, which is unusual for this podcast. Yeah, I'm buoyant. I've had the first game of Boofy Bingo in weeks. Oh yeah, after weeks, finally got to put Toby's press conference on the big screen and cheer when he said "mindful." Well, he for me the one that like made me perk up was like "we are where we are," and I was just like, "Yes, yes. this man is back." <laughs> yeah, he's moved we into didn't... some summer wardrobe of just a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> It's February. Why wouldn't he be? Yeah, and he said, "We are where we are," and it was perfect. <laughs> oh, that was a well, yeah. Well, well, we we will come on to that as well. Uh, how how's uh, how's the week been, boys? How, you know, do you enjoy the game on Saturday? Enjoy is a strong word. Um, Fact, sorry, it was... did you enjoy the Adam Beard miss pass? Oh, mate, mate, which one? Which one? There was yeah, two. Which one? Yeah. Glorious, glorious man. Glorious moments, plural. Um, yeah, it was a, as a fan, horrible experience. Um, as a rugby fan, it was perhaps not, you know, the finest game I've ever played, but there was drama. So that's what matters most in the Six Nations, I always yeah. believe firmly. Um, and I don't know. It's a weird one to know how to feel about the Wales game. Um because both Wales should have won it in so many ways. Um, and yet, you know, you do buy the whole, it's a young team and they're developing. And we've seen, you know, from Nottoist's perspective, how much they have been able to kick on over the last couple of years um, in terms of when young players get more exposure and build from being in those situations before. Yeah. Yes, yes then how did you enjoy the game? Um, it, was okay. it was okay, I thought. It, it, you know, I thought Wales played well in the first half and then... Hmm. There was just chances missed in the second half, which you thought, oh, you could have done with that one. And you, you, it, it obviously, you know, with someone like George Ford, the five is obviously going to come back and uh, sting you a little bit. And, and they did. And, and England took their, their chance as well. They took their try rather well. Um, and, and yeah, that was probably that, that, that Ford penalty was, was like, you know, is there a score in Wales? I don't know. And you kind of felt like the opportunity had been missed. Um, hmm. Adam Beard pinched the lineup for Maro Atorje, so that is um, <laughs> great fun. And um, that was the personal highlight of the weekend. Just wait till you see what he does to James Ryan. Oh, wait, oh. James Ryan will be on the bench. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, they've, they've, I'm actually... they've lost Keenan, so um, James Ryan. That, that, well, of course, I think most of the Irish side might just don't want to face a, a, a double miss pass from Adam Beard. So um, that that might be that. Who knows? James Ryan is so desperate to play for the Lions, he's willing to go in at fullback. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a great time on Saturday, mainly because I was too inebriated. To, well, I wasn't inebriated. I was, I, it was my baby shower on Saturday. Oh, um, yeah. Congratulations. And yeah, so then we went to the. So, so when my girlfriend told me that her and the baby's godmother had arranged it for the tent, I said, "Why does the tent stick out in my mind?" I thought, and, the, and so the first one was we had a very important rugby game in my local club. I was just like, "Well, I'm going to have to miss it." That was fine. And then she was like, "Oh yeah, it's Wales, England, it's England, Wales." I was like, "Well, all right, okay, that's what it is." So we had, we um we we sauntered over over to a pub for um. In, in southwest London, uh, me, my, my best friend and my father, the only Welsh people interested in the rugby there. And in a, in a very um, rugby thing, the very London, very English man behind me 
at the end of the mm. game, we sort of tur- we sort of turned round and, and sort of shook their hand because we've been like bantering back and forth with them. He went, "Oh, you boys are Welsh." I said, "I said yes, very." And he went, "Oh, I'm Max Llewellyn's cousin." Um, and then <laughs> proceeded to show <laughs> proceeded to show me photos of him and Max Llewellyn, um, and I was uh. like, "Oh, brilliant! Oh, this is fantastic! This is so That's rugby, gloriously um, Welsh rugby." Yeah, so uh, that's brilliant. Um, <laughs> let's, we've got a lot to get into. Let's move on to the news. Um, a lot, a lot of news. Let's start with what broke uh, just after we went on air last week, actually. Um, I awoke to a message from our good friend at DJ Russo, who is the go-to man for everything Cheetahs related. Um, a fantastic follow on Twitter. Uh, it's essential if you're an Ospreys fan. But he messaged me saying that three more South African players, or Cheetahs players in particular, are on their way over. So they uh, flew from Amsterdam, where they were based for the European Games, back to, uh, to, to Swansea. So they are Victor Sikatete, I think is how you say it. Mm. Um, I am, um, yeah, Victor, go for it. Uh, who is a lock forward and weirdly the cheetah's captain. Mm. Um, did this break last week? I can't remember if we talked about it last week. Yeah, it was, no, it was tail end of last week. I think it was Thursday or Friday. It was tail end of last week, right. Okay. Um, and then they flew over on Monday. Yeah, who is, yeah, who is, the, uh, who is cheetah's club captain and lock, former mm. South Africa under 20s. Um, Giandre Rudolph, uh, who is primarily a back row forward. <laughs> an eighth man, uh, but can play as a fetcher if needed. Can also play lock. Uh, DJ Russo described him as his favourite player, so we'll see. And then the greatest name in rugby, Ivadi Boshoff, um, who is an outside centre, who in his Instagram photos looks huge, but I've hmm. been pointed out that he's five foot eleven and eighty five kilograms. Oh, him and Keith together. Yeah, so they no. might break a hundred kilograms if they play together. Um, I I love the thought of him and Kieran Williams playing together because they are the world's first onomatopoeic centre combo. Yeah, Boshoff and Kieran Williams together. That's brilliant. Um, so they joined up, like Robbie said, they joined up with the squad on Monday. Um, we'll come on to the press conference in a bit, but it does sound like at least one of them will be involved hmm. uh, next week. Uh, on Sunday, even. Then, moving through the week, um, <laughs> late on, what was it, Tuesday night? Um, so the EDC published nine teams that will be playing in the competition uh, next year. Um, I haven't got the list. I don't care enough. Um, <laughs> but essentially, Nice wasn't one of them. And... Neath supporters group uploaded a state a, he- a hastily written statement on Twitter from the notes app, um, which is always a great place to write a statement um, about what basically Neath's feelings on this towards the WIU. And the last paragraph then was very uh, derogatory and inflammatory towards the Ospreys. Hmm. Um. And they sort of just, this was breaking, so uh, Robert Rees, who's big in the, in the Premiership, sort of the worst Premiership, broke the news. Um, me, who was winding down for the for the night, had to obviously then <laughs> sort this out. So I was messaging around different people, um, trying to get a statement of my own. Um, I managed to get one that said that the Ospreys have, like, you know, not rubbished the statement, but have said this is deeply inaccurate. And Ospreys then released their own statement um, saying that this is wrong, um, we want to work with Neath and, and, and whatnot. And so we thought, right, there we are. And then, weirdly, Neath released another statement. Um, but this one was quite hidden. And th- this one then said that, oh, do you know what? Actually, now we had a meeting with Lance Bradley. He's sound. Um, there's going to be a working relationship, but it's actually all the WIU's fault. Mm. So, and as I said to someone earlier on, there's a there's a bit in the Al Murray in, in an Al Murray uh, stand up set 
where he says to someone, I would explain the crisis in the Middle East to you, but every time I explain it, it gets more and more complicated. That's essentially what this is, and that's what the EDC is. Um, well, I've greatly enjoyed watching Neef do this because initially it seemed like they're the bloke in the pub that's going on about, you know, some bloke they know and how they beat them up if they could and how they're a shit and how they need to, you know, back off. And then suddenly that bloke turns around and backs into them and takes a glance at them. At which point Neef go, no, I'm still really angry, but I'm angry with uh, your boss. And there's just a big vibe of them not wanting to them being very, very angry um, and then changing their target. My other favourite thing is the fact that through all their statements on both yes, Twitter, is, uh, on Facebook, on too, yeah. the rest, yeah. the Ospreys is always sort of a low case of... And this has been everything brought up to me by so many people. It's like, why do they refuse everything to else is grammatic. the Ospreys? Yeah. The rest is all grammatically correct, but the Ospreys is always small case O. The I, sheer pettiness I of it. Live for that, and I respect Neath even more for that. Mm. If I'm honest, just by not capitalising the Ospreys, like oh, they've capitalised the Lex Tan Null, everything. Like <laughs> they hate the WIU, but they've they've capitalised them. Look, Neath. All three of us aren't involved in Nice at all, mm. right? Yestin is in a bit of a tough position, obviously being uh, employed by Ponte This is why I'm purposely not talking to him on this subject. Um, I'm trying to save him from employer liability laws. Um, we don't know enough of what's happened. Um, there is historic bad beef between both Osprey's management mm. and Nice management, and Nice obviously having a really tough uh, few years financially. We really do hope that a working relationship is, uh, you know, is happening and uh, um, it all sorts itself out because, you know, Ospreys and Neath historically are intertwined. Um, mm. So the, the final statement by Neath was the WIU gave us the above reasons this afternoon. Having had a very productive meeting with the Osprey CEO, Ospreys is not capitalised. We discussed our mutual desires to work together. We are seeking grant funding for some redevelopment facilities. After the current facilities were mentioned as the reason they can't pay to play at our ground, change in room size and access for broadcasters, which is fair enough. Having been to Knoll very recently, it is not up to standard. Mm. Um, and that's not saying Bridgend is either, but it's clearly more up to standard. Um Upgrades will be made soon and some will be revealed very soon. To clarify, we would welcome a closer relationship between region and club and their CEO wishes for the same. Unfortunately for now, the WIU has given us some reasons we felt imperative to defend and explain to our fans. So it, it does seem like it was a, something that was written with a lot of emotion um, mm. in mind. And look, it, it's not gone away, but it's certainly gone to bed a bit. Yeah, you imagine there were some flurried, panicked emails the following morning. Yeah. This is the sort of thing that never would have happened during the day. If Neve had put that statement out during the working day before 5 p.m., then we probably would have seen it play out very differently. You know, probably could have been resolved behind the scenes. But the fact this yeah. came out in an evening, everyone then picked up on it while, you know, Osprey's employees are out of, you know, out of working hours and everyone had to kind of panic to calm it down, probably led to things blowing up a bit more than they necessarily um had to it was all just very very welsh rugby in the end poor, I think. poor poor tobias who runs the osprey social media um <laughs> getting the probably getting the text from from lance like it was literally about half 11 saying i need you to write this statement really quickly 11 um, 13 p.m the osprey statement was published it's, it's absolutely brilliant and the, yes, the best bit is the new statement was then published 20 minutes later yeah, they're not like, not like they tweeted out. They just replied to Lance Bradley, yeah. reply to them. That's why it got so lost on people. Um, yes, you could talk about this next bit because um, you won't get sued. Um, good stadium. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Lance tweeted out last night about um, Cardiff and their seemingly close to sellout for the, their Connacht game. And he's hinting at the Ospreys not selling many tickets at all. Um, 
and that sparked a lot of back and forth um, about stadiums and accessibility and all this. And, and Lance tweeted out saying, "We have the best, um, we have the best rugby stadium." I think is what he said, or stadium for rugby. Now, what I think Lance meant by that is that they have the best in terms of facilities for players and for media and for the the actual playing of the rugby's not for fan experience for accessibility for 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 all this like we know it's not news to us but that's what he meant i think and you can tell me all about rugby parade and, and carna farms park but the fact is in terms of actual facilities for players to use the swans.com stadium is the best up before mm. it's a prem it's a premier league football stadium let's let's not beat around the bush there now a lot of people have got angry at lance ospreys and, and other regions alike and look we as a pod are not um in any way uh i want to put this out there we're not in any way paid um by the club we are not in any way inclined to say things about the club or its management blah 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 we do not necessarily agree with everything that the lance has said or in the way in which he said it but what we do appreciate is the fact that we now have a management and a ceo who is willing to go out and engage and ask these hard questions hmm. that and there was a really um good point on facebook earlier by someone who said that ultimately he's right if we want to redevelop or have a new stadium, then there needs to be the demand for it. And there is a chicken and the egg argument. You could say, well, if we build a new stadium, the fans will come. But actually, if we're not getting 5 6K plus at every home game, what's the point in having it? So, yes, uh, have I explained that right, do you think? Um, yeah, I think probably this is where Lance Bradley went a little bit wrong by saying there was like, the best stadium in Wales. I think I think probably most people read that as like a collective, including the things like atmosphere and like location. Yeah. There's been a lot of comments saying, you know, the location is not very good in Swansea. And in fairness, if you go to the Arms Park, you can't really you can't really miss it because it's right in the middle of the city. And I, one thing clear that in terms of atmosphere, personally, I think Cardiff Arms Park is probably a lot better than what it is now compared to what the amount the attendance wise it is in Swansea. And on a good day, Rodney Parade is also probably quite up there as well. And mm. I think where there wouldn't be complaints is if the Ospreys had attend had an average attendance of say around twelve to thirteen thousand, yeah. you know, that stadium becomes a little bit more full. And there's obviously more atmosphere being generated and everyone's a bit, you know, everyone's closer together than three, 4,000 people being spaced out. So there's a, a higher average attendance. You, that's where I think, as well as the, the rugby facilities, that's where I think uh, Lance Bradley was trying to aim at in terms of, you know, if there was a really good crowd of the Ospreys, I think the atmosphere would be genuinely a lot better than what it would be and yeah. and you just kind of see it in that way in a way and like you just said that about the that the attendances need to be a bit better if they want to redevelop one of the grounds and or potentially move there um so it's probably a bit more of an emphasis on osprey supporters turning up mm -hmm. even if you only turn up to one game a season or, or two games a season or even if you go out and buy a season ticket here and there you know if if the Ospreys attendance continues to be a roughly around three to four thousand, I think it, it would be a bit of a trouble over the next couple of years. But I think Lance Bradley's point in that example was, you know, in terms of rugby facilities, I think he thinks that the Swansea.com is the best stadium out of the lot. And he probably agreed with him because the stadium facilities is more modern compared to what the Arms Park is, compared to what Rodney Parade is. Um, but 
if there was 12, 13,000 coming into the Ospreys every week, you know, there's still quite a lot of empty seats there, but there, there's probably not much complaints as there is compared to now when there's 3,000 people there. So, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of an interesting one. And, um, and yeah, you know, for, for any Osprey supporters out there that might be on the fence about coming to games, you know, if you do come to games in the stadium, you know, crowd numbers will go up. You might get a bit more of an atmosphere, okay, not the perfect level of atmosphere you might see elsewhere, but if that helps the redevelopment of a new ground, or even potentially keeping the Ospreys afloat in some ways with the, the budget cuts and everything that's going around in, in Welsh rugby, then... And I, I strongly advise buying a ticket here and there. And do, <laughs> and do you know what? I, I get it if we were back in the performances of the Alan Clark era. And we'll talk mm. about that later mm-hmm. in Good Player. But we're not. And Lance is right when we're saying we've won. We're, we're five, uh, five wins in the league. We've qualified for knockout in Europe. But eighty six percent of home games won. Eighty six percent of home games. Sixty two percent of games won in the season. We've got a European knockout game, which by all means is selling well, and long may it continue. Mm. Um, we have got arguably the most exciting breed of youngsters, um, who have all been on display. Like I said, we've used the second most amount of players in the UFC. Um, we're playing a good brand of rugby at the minute. We've certainly expanded um, in, in terms of our style of play. Th- th- there's reasons to come. I get the Cardiff feel-good factor, right? I, I 100% get it. But the reality is Cardiff have won three games this season. Yeah, three games. And that, that's not me disparaging Cardiff. I get why the feel-good factor is that, again, they've got great youngsters. They do play an exciting brand of rugby. You know, but they they they've won three games, right? We won our Champions Cup games last year, right? And we took a thousand of fans up to Saracens. We 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 know the knock on effect it has. We just need it consistently, right? If you support, if you put your weight behind these players, right, they will pay it back in dividends. Mm. Is there any more to say about that, or should we go into the good news? Well, I think it's interesting with the new stadium potentially coming over the next couple of years as well just with that in the background um both in terms of what they're looking at and what the ospreys are hoping for in terms of developing a stadium that's perhaps more modern in its facilities than the arms park than rodney parade yeah. have been um which is an interesting that perspective but the other point is just a you know the better atmosphere will drive more people in as well as the the team continue to do stuff so yeah, yeah. um you know what it's one of these things, right, where I don't think anything incorrect has been said, but it's very easy to take out of context. Yeah. Heaven knows I've been there before. <laughs> I, and and like I said, Lance has the best intentions at mm. heart, and, you know, it is very refreshing. To, and Jamie said it on Rap on Monday, everything that Lance is doing now, uh, David uh, Buttress has already done. Yeah, yeah. Right, shoot moment to the really good news. Yeah, I love good news. So, it's my favourite. We we finally have some contract renewals. Um, so uh, I've been pestering Ospreys for so long now <laughs> on the IRE Twitter account. Um, so our first bit of good news came with Keelan Giles re-signing the region with a really cool video of him mm. scoring for one of under 16s and then scoring for the Ospreys in the exact same way. Um, I love that. Um, so Keelan Giles, Keelan Giles with the monologue signed. he's giving yeah. over the top oh. the like intro to a rap video from the noughties, loved it so he's re-signed uh, yes, then how important is Keelan Giles? Um, uh, very he's, you know, he's, he's over the last probably say the last year or so he's really established himself as a first team player um, he's got over that really horrid injury run that he had and um, you know, since he's had a consistent run in the in the squad, he's you know, if you look at this season, he's been he's been playing really well. You know, took his try well against Cardiff. Obviously, got the second when the the pitch started to deteriorate near the end. And you know, I thought he was 
very good out in in the two European matches as well against Perpignan and and the Lions. So scored against Connacht as well, and and scored our first try of the season. So um, yeah, it's it's a it's a good resigning. You know, he's he's still relatively young, and um, it's it's exciting to see how he's going to kick on over the next year or so. So we thought that was done for the day, and then I pushed some more, and well. The best episode of A Place in the Sun I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> because the man we thought, and I thought we were going to lose. I genuinely thought, I thought this is his last season. Tommy Bota, the Stellenbosch sniper, or as I call him, Tom Bota, uh, born in Pontevedra, um, has uh, re-signed. Um, this made me so happy. Mm. Uh, because... There's there's this new thing around props, right? And I'm going to blame Ellis Genge for this, and I love Genge. Is that scrop uh, scrops props main job now is not to scrum. Scrops, scrops, mm. yeah. <laughs> props main job now is not to scrum. Mm. And I don't want to live in that world anymore. As a prop, I want to scrum. Uh, you know, and, and that's what Tom Boat does. Mm. He's there to to push very hard in the scrum, and by God, he does. And to hit rucks because he supports someone else while they carry the ball. And that is all I want from him. You can have your Reese Carries, you can have your Archie Griffins, you can have all those bollocks. I want a prop who clearly is having an asthma attack on the fourth minute uh, <laughs> and and will just push scrums all day. Right. How many metres do you make off a good carry by a prop like Reese Carries, you mentioned? Um how many of it like Hollywood props you want to mention, right? How many meters do you make off a good carry by them? Like three or four? In a game four, they might carry four for meters, yeah. Yeah. They might carry for twenty to thirty meters, right? How many meters are you making off Tom Bota smashing every scrum? Yeah. If he if he's winning a penalty off each scrum, you're knocking that downfield, you're making thirty meters each time. Tom Bota should be winning every award for most meters made in the URC. I say. That's my yeah. my rationale. There's a genuine um, argument to be made that he is Osprey's best at non worst qualified cycle. Oh, he's the best. Of, I think he's got to be right up there, best of the post Galacticos era. Um, yeah. He's up there in recent times. Well, you he, know, obviously, Tommy Bow and Jerry yeah, Collins it, and so on all we're stand out. If, but... if we're talking about, about Bow, Tia Tia, Collins, Tia Tia, Ola, yeah. And then genuinely slipping into number five could well be Tommy Boto. Yeah. Because he's been here since 2018. He's on 113 appearances. Um, Martin Gillingham loves him. Um, he's only ever missed what, two games, <laughs> something <laughs> like that. Um, and Martin Gillingham will continue to remind me of that. Um, Hassler and Ardron, I guess the other names that deserve mention. See, on a personal but, level, Tyler Ardron is, like, number one. Yeah. But in terms of but, impact... Yeah. Hassler, though. Yeah, but he got it off to Hassler. He did get, he did get it off to Hassler. <laughs> he got it off to Hassler. Ring the bell, take your drink, down your <laughs> vodka, <laughs> move along. He did get it off to Hassler, though. Um, and he still can't believe it. <laughs> you still can't believe it. It's the way he says, I'm sorry, I'm going to come back to that the ready dark bit, but it's the way he says it because he clearly doesn't. He clearly doesn't see the ball being passed because <laughs> Tipper no, takes I it in. I remember <laughs> not seeing it at the time. I remember watching that live and being like, "Oh God, he's in Hassel's hands now. He, he has truly got it off to Hassler. How oh. did he do it? How did he get it off to Hassler? That was a scrum cap era as well. Yeah. Oh, peak, peak stuff. Peak, man. Um, anyway, over the weekend. Right, no, we, we haven't got enough time yep. to go Fair into point. This. Sorry. Um, finally, um, getting a fresh trim and a new contract is a certain Max Naji. Mm. I'm Which very excited. Go on. He was like the surprise to me. Um, yes. Keelan's a lovely retention, you know. But I wasn't hugely surprised by it. I was very glad of it. I was delighted by it. Um, and, you know, by that video, by everything. Look, if we can retain any former nominee of the BBC Young Sports Personality of the Year um, and 
Then, <laughs> just... Previous winners of that award include Tom Daly, Andy Murray, and Wayne Rooney. And Keelan Giles was one of the three nominees that year. Because he got a hat-trick um, in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> what a guy. He scored two tries against England in the 20s. Um, with Matt Provero at 10 for England. Um, look, that's obviously wonderful. Uh, Tom Boto was a fantastic retention. As I, said, I would have imagined one or two of the South African clubs, or especially clubs in France, be after him. Um, but retaining him was great news. Max Nadji was one I expected to lose. I was kind of expecting him to be a Sam Underhill or Ethan Roos, as we now discover, who will further ambitions and go off and play in the Premiership and probably excel. You know, he's from Northampton, grew up playing for Northampton, grew up as a Northampton fan. Uh, there's clips of him out there playing for like an England age grade side at 10. Um, and where he's interviewed and says like his dreams to play for Northampton, whatever. Um, I figured that would, that would happen. Um, but instead, he's clearly really loved his time with the Osprey team's a big part of this group, you watch those little things they do with the players coming off the end of training and ask them a question. The amount of times they use him as a punchline, um, he's clearly, you know, a very valued part of the squad um, as the, the squad Ken, um, as he was dubbed during kind of Barbenheimer week. Um, yeah, I thought I thought he was going to be off. I thought he was going to head to the Premiership and try his chances at an England call-up. And really glad to keep hold of him really glad to have him there him and yes and hopkins able to kind of battle for that shirt in the long run yeah yes then um obviously we took we've talked about length at naggy we've been staunch naggy defenders actually <laughs> throughout our little group chat with with some Osprey's people um where especially when yes and hopkins came because naggy he had a really couple of nasty injuries. I think one of them was against Ulster, actually, in that home win. Um, and he sort of didn't look, because he burst onto the scene, then he had these injuries, and then he sort of didn't look comfortable. And then Yesin Hopkins came in, and then Osprey's fans went, ooh, shiny thing. And, and you know, it was like, this is my sweet little ginger prince, and you can do no wrong. And then Nagy, up until his injury at Benetton, how, how just how good is he and how vital is he to this to this Osprey system going forward. Yeah, I think he really kicked on, um, especially at the start of this season. Um, the only downside to all this is I can't run my joke about him inevitably joining Northampton for another year or two, which is probably good news more than anything. But um, yeah, he seems to have kind of balanced everything up now, in a way. Obviously, it's a bit of a shame that that Benton game where he did go off injured because... He was looking in real good form and he obviously took his try in the second half and you kind of just felt there was a bit more balance there as well. And um, hopefully he makes a, a really speedy recovery from his injury because he didn't look good that, that particular injury against Benedict. Mm. And um, when he's back, hopefully he can hit the, hit the ground running and continue the form that he showed at the start of the year. would just like to point out as well that he is not 27 Hey Griffin, I know you're listening. He is not 27. He's younger than me. He's 24. Um, I, on, on a personal level, I'm really happy with this because I watched Nagy from when he started in university. Mm. I watched him get a pro deal. I used to watch him every Wednesday at St. Helens, play for Swansea Evening with Hugh Sutton. Um, and he was bloody good. Like you can ask Dave Rogers as well how good Nagy was, and he's done some punditry stuff for Bucks as well. He's he's God, he's the prototype. He's what people look for in a fullback now. He's what, six foot four, four in stone. You know, probably works and it needs to work on his high ball retention a bit. Mm. But the fact that he is, he's six four. He's going to get up there. He's not going to get out jumped very often. It's just making. It's just getting him to the point where he's catching it and catching it. And he runs a lovely line. Christ, look at that zebra try. Uh, the dragon zebra. He comes from nowhere on a on a beautiful line, and then does that awful swan dive. Hmm. Um, his. I've always said he'd make a great thirteen, right? When hmm. Justin Hopkins came along, and I was like, "How does Nadge get into this team?" I was like, "Well, train him at 13. He's played there before. Because you look at that try against Benetton, where he. And he gets on the outside of Umaga, and you're like, "How do you stop that?" Um, that's ridiculous. Like, he's six foot four, fourteen stone, gets on the outside of you with that turn of pace. 
He can just do, like, I just think he's got the building blocks to be such an integral part of this system for years to come. Mm. He's got 32 appearances in the minute. He scored six tries. You know, he, I don't think he'll ever be one to set the world on fire. Mm. And that's well, right. Because you can just set my world on fire. Because that's what he does. <laughs> he, happy he does, Valentine's you know, Day. Yeah, Happy Valentine's Day, Max. Please call me back. Um, <laughs> but you know, you just but just looking at the way he plays, like he sets up that uh, try for Dan Edwards and the Scarlet. You know his commitment uh, in that try against the Sharks. You know, it, that, he's so. I just, I'm just so happy that we've managed to retain him. And like Robbie said, I thought he was going to be one that, that we were going to lose. Mm. But there's also implication in the press conference from Toby Booth that there's a few more coming. He says that there's a good number that have signed. And he says, you guys oh, yeah. don't know who's who's staying. He does. Mm. So there's more to come. By the time most people are listening to this, I imagine there probably will have been one or two more. It looks like they're going to trickle them out over the course of this full week, leading into the Lens- the yeah. Ulster game, rather. Um, and then probably more afterwards, which is fantastic news. And yeah, hopefully we have a few more coming in the next few days. Um, it feels like a lot of the perhaps bigger names, the ones that be more under threat, were the ones that signed contracts last year. Um, I did have a moment of going through, so like Lake and Morgan's contracts and Nicky Smith's all say years plural in the contract, yeah. so you presume it's at least two seasons for each of them. Um, so they may come up next year, but yeah, it's a lot of those really important squad players that are coming up, so the likes of Keelan Giles and um. Yeah, the likes of Nagy and so on. That hopefully we're going to see a few more of them retained and signed over the next couple of weeks. And considering where we were this time last year in terms of player retention, you know, we didn't have we we didn't currently have a squad of fifteen to put out um, for the following season. By the end, by after the Saracens game, I think after the end of the season, I think it was like after that last game against Cardiff mm. that you know we finally had some contracts starting to come out. So it's great to be seeing this happen so early. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, just that feel good factor just gets put back in the club when you get something like that. Mm. Right. I think that's it for the news. And a, and a mixed bag of news this week, but ultimately some really, 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 really positive stuff. Mm. Well, um, I suppose... Go on. Go on. No, no, just the, the other point is the injuries, isn't it? Which will lead us on to oh, yes. yeah, the Ulster yeah. game. Do we want to do we want to do injury room now then? Should we, should we talk about the injuries? As we can, we or can. Do you want to wait? We can shuffle between the two, I guess. Okay, I I was going to propose that we do good player now, and then end okay. the Ulster preview. Okay. Because I feel like if we do, because we'll just want to go to good player. Mm. Um. So in in. There was there was some deliberation, believe it or not, because Robbie sent in one of the best Ospreys tries, literally about five minutes before recording, <laughs> which was Tommy Bow in twenty ten um, at the old Raven. What's yeah, Raven Hill. Raven Hill. Raven Hill. It was Raven Hill. Or was that the? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was Raven Hill, um, where Adam Jones fronts it upfield, and then Tommy Bow comes out of nowhere to score against his home province. Um, Glorious, Brilliant. game but, played on a Wednesday night for whatever reason. Instead, we are going with what we promised, which was um, face charge down game. Yes. So this was Ospreys twenty six, uh, Ulster twenty four. Now let me give you a bit of context going into this game. Um, that's Max Nagy's in, uh, not Instagram, uh, Wikipedia. So. Uh, let's look at some stuff that maybe you know don't matter. So our, our average age of forwards is twenty eight. It's not you know when you see the squad you're like fair enough. Uh, backs twenty six. Yeah. Different nationalities for starters: eighty seven percent Welsh, seven percent English, seven uh, percent South African. Pretty standard. On the bench again: eighty three percent Welsh, nine uh, percent South African, four uh, percent English, and four percent Moldovan. Uh, we'll come on to to that later as well Um, (laughs) then so we look at the table uh, beforehand so do you remember uh, what what were 
before this yesterday. Uh, weren't they bottom of Conference A, something like that? We were bottom. Weren't, no. I remember going over this as a point of pride because there was very little else to enjoy that season, right? I remember working out, certainly at one point, I think in the lead up to this game, around the start of the Six Nations this year, in 2020 that was, um, the Ospreys were the worst team in any of the three major European leagues. They yeah, won the we fewest were. games, they collected the fewest points, they were dead bottom, like the lowest of the low. They should have been super relegated to like six divisions down in like the Russian leagues. So, just to, you know, the week before, we'd lost 25-18 to the Dragons at Rodney Parade. Um, the Scarlets had won 16-14 in Cardiff. Uh, Ulster, our opposition, had uh, mm. beat Munster 38-17. But no, today was a different day. <laughs> we were to win our second game of the season. Um, so let's go through the Ulster team very quickly. And I've got it in my notebook right here. Um, also with our team ready for our team prediction later um, at loose head for Ulster was Eric O'Sullivan good oh, player good player, good good player. player. I'd forgotten uh, this Adam, was the game and I got suddenly yeah. excited hearing the name Eric O'Sullivan <laughs> Adam McBurney don't remember him that vague much. memories of him Solid one of those player. players if he said his name to me I'll say oh yeah he played hooker for Ulster couldn't tell you anything else about him <laughs> uh, three Marty Moore Oh, good player. Good yes, player. Good player. Yeah, tidy player, yeah. I just realised he was on the bench. I just thought, oh, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, the bench is good as well. Uh, Perhaps four, more and Marty Alan, more later. Alan O'Connor. Oh, good player. He's skipper good player. Time. I think he was. was. Skipper that day. I'm going to write that down. He was skipper. Now, I have in my head, Alan O'Connor is like a Northern Irish Stuart Hooper. <laughs> he gives off that vibe. Like really sound, yeah. But we'll go into a middle management job <laughs> when when John McFarlane eventually leaves Ulster. Alan O'Connor's just going to replace him. But it just sounds right, didn't it? Alan O'Connor, Ulster coach. <laughs> He's uh, one five. of these players. No, absolutely nothing against him. I hope he never gets a cap for Ireland because it's too perfect. <laughs> one of those players that should play about four hundred games for Ulster. You know, he's um, not. Look, he's. He's currently played 189 games for Ulster. He, I hope, is less than halfway through his career with them. And 12 caps but... to the Wolfhounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Retires the Wolfhounds' most cap player, but yeah. never wins a senior cap. If he does, it's like off the bench against Samoa when the Lions are away. <laughs> Somehow Rob Howley's coaching them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you, then you've got partner in the second row is Kieran Treadwell. Who I Good really player. like. I really like yeah. Kieran Treadwell. Yeah. Um, always won by him. Always stood by. You're oh, underrated, Kieran Treadwell. Fantastic back row of Matty Rea, who I really liked. Uh, Sean Reedy, who I thought was vastly underrated in a time where uh, Ireland had some fantastic open sides, and then Marcel Marcel Kutzia, who haunts my dreams of how good he is as a number eight. That is a very good rugby blood, bloody good back row. And I was like, yes. Um, Dave Shanahan. Yeah, he, good, yeah he was all right. Yeah. A de- decent, reasonable player. I think um, he, I think he played the full 80 that night, thinking about it. He, I think he did. Who was in the bench? Okay. Um, One of those players that's just about still going, David Shanahan. Like he pops up every now and again on the bench for Ulster. At 10, William Burns. Billy Burns. Oh. I think this was his Bill. inaugural season at Ulster. That would make sense. Having jumped from Gloucester. Yeah. I, where he'd been. I, I, I fine. like Billy Burns. I thought it was a weird signing. When, I, when he first went, I thought, what? Because Freddie was always a bit of a meme because he was like, oh, I beat the All Blacks in my debut. And he was always like, do you know what? He's a good player, but he's not a good player. You know what I mean? I, like, yeah. And I think then he had his... I think nobody honest. discovered he qualified for Ireland until like the day he signed for Ulster. Mm. I think that was like the big one. And 
I remember being around this time when he first signed for Ulster. I think it was right before he played his first game. Um, I went to the the Ospreys played Munster in Europe in Turin Park. Um, Kai Evans kicked all our points that day. It was miserable. Um, not because of Kai Evans kicking the points, because of the points the other team scored. Um, but I remember talking to some Munster fans afterwards who were saying they would rather go into a game without a fly half and lose it than have Billy Burns at 10 because he's English. Right. And they were furious about the thought of him playing for Ireland. Well, I'm completely wrong, by the way. He has he joined Ulster in 2018. Okay. So he has 101 appearances for Gloucester and 106 for Ulster. That's not bad. He has seven caps for Ireland, eight caps for England and the 20s. Um, One of won... my worst age takes was saying they should be starting um, him over Sexton in 2021 when Sexton had a bad run of form. <laughs> and I was like, they should be starting Billy Burns over him. And then that aged so badly. Wasn't great. I won't lie. Um, so that that was Billy Burns. Now this this is a good backline. This is a really good backline. There. So you got eleven is Louis Ludic. Oh, good player. Really sure good player. Scored against us in the previous fixture. Oh. Yeah. Twelve year Stuart McCloskey, who turned up for his annual. I'm going to batter the Ostrons, um, as he does every time he plays us. <laughs> Always, pop, always pops up and scores or does something really, really good. In, in the end. the last time we played them at home, he does this outrageous offload to Robert Balakun right in front of him. Yeah, I remember that. I was I'm probably in line with it as well. <laughs> yeah, bastard. Um, <laughs> 13, Luke Marshall. Oh, good player. Good player, underrated player. Yeah. Had like one of those players who had what looked to be a really promising international career, got one injury and never got back in the squad. Oh, sure. 11 caps for Ireland, I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, 11 I remember caps. scoring at Scotland once. Um, 14, Robert Balakoon. The oh, really yes. good player. The nearly player. He's a good, good oh, player. Really good really yeah. player. Yeah. Never, never really kicked on other than being like a good club player. Big Bob, Balakun. really hot. Yeah, big Bob Alakum, great Large name. Robert, great name, good looking guy. Um, yeah, just never really kicked on at international level. He's one of those and guys then... that's won enough lotteries in life that only being a good club player probably levels everything out. Yeah. And then at 15 is a man I have no remembrance of. is Matt Faddis, who was an Australian. Oh, no, New Zealander. Kind of, yeah. Great player. I think Sorry, yes, did. I think he dropped a high ball after about 10 minutes in this one as well. He was a um, centre primarily, as I remember. Um, I didn't really think he could play fullback, but he was a good centre. Uh, I was at the Highlanders for a long time and kind of... Yeah, one of those Highlanders. players that, like... Um, you know, Kiwi rugby hipsters would bring up as, oh, he should be an all-black. He should be an all-black. And then, you know, the, the likes of me and Paul Williams would be like, yeah, great player, you know, be a hell of a signing for someone. Uh, went into Ulster and was fine. But yeah, you tell uh, you back. I always thought him as a centre, but I think he played a lot on the wing as well. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, a full-back. He joined, he joined Ulster as a full-back for some unknown reason. That was weird. Mm. Didn't really settle in. Well, on the bench, and another greedy good bench, John Andrew, great name, good player. <laughs> um, Jack McGrath. Jack Mc... Lion, Tess Lion. Yeah, Tess Lion, really good player. It's one of those um, where, like, I feel if you are a Tess Lion, like Adam Beard, perhaps, then, but maybe not, you know, um, some other people, uh, then saying good player feels patronizing. If you won a World yeah. Cup or played a te Lions test, then saying good player, maybe you're a step above, you know? So James Ryan, good player. But Jack McGrath, good player. <laughs> um, Tom O'Toole, good, good, good reason, player. yeah, reasonably good player. Um, was in the Ireland squad on the weekend, was he not? Tom O'Toole. Um, yeah, yeah, he was on the bench against Italy. Yeah, yeah. Um, weirdly, still only twenty-five. Up. Wow. So I... he was. Yeah, he was young. He's got an old face. Yeah. So. Then we go on to David O'Connor, which I think is quite 
cheated if you have an Alan O'Connor and then a David O'Connor. Were they related? I want to say no. I don't think they were. I'm going to have a look. He plays for Ealing Trailfinders now, though. Oh, what a lucky sausage he is. Yeah. Um, Alan O'Connor. Dave, David O'Connor connor comes up when you type Alan O'Connor brother in. Yeah, they're brothers. It's, oh, it's they're Alan brothers. O'Connor's shit brother. Man, what a genre. What a player. Yeah. Yeah, 15 games for Ulster, then went off to Ealing, where he still is. He went on loan initially, then decided him on a permanent basis. Good. Well, not a good player. Jordy yeah. Murphy. Yeah. Oh, I good player. Murphy. Yeah, Jordy Murphy. Great player. I remember I remember writing a piece soon as the um, World Rugby eligibility laws changed saying that he could qualify for Spain. So of he's, course. he's a good player. Oh, my God. They could have had a back row of Josh McLeod and Jordy Murphy. <laughs> I mean, one of them would always be injured, but they could have had a back <laughs> row of it. Um, 21 is Johnny Stewart. Who I only I remember as just sitting behind um, <laughs> uh, whatever his name was. Um, Jimmy Stewart, his brother. No. <laughs> it's a wonderful life. No, who's the name? <laughs> he died for his really family tree. Life. One of them sees Who's a it? giant invisible... Yeah. One of them sees a giant invisible rabbit. The other one sees a giant invisible John Cooney. And they're both haunted by each of them. Then you've got Bill Johnston, who I'm sorry is not a rugby player that's playing I, this. He, he tried a late drop goal in the last play, apparently. Mm. Is he? Well, he's in MLR now, I think. He went off no, somewhere, Matt. Not. No? So, his career after Ulster went to Ealing and then to Richmond. Oh, okay. The Ted Lasso Bill effect. Johnston. And then Craig Gilroy, who, again, good player. Yeah. Good player, good player. So that was a that was a decent um, uh, squad. So Robert Balakun scored in the ninth minute before Matt Fadders uh, fell over the try line. I'm going to say because he's mm. not a real person. Um, and scored in the sixtieth minute, and then ten minutes later, Stuart McCloskey scored um, again, turning up for his one good game against uh, the Ospreys per year. So let's move on to the Ospreys team that day. A bit of a mixed bag in this one. So. Starting off, Nicky Smith, good player, was good, probably a yeah. shining yeah. star in this pile of shit that was the Alan Clark era. I'm sure he'll get a mention later on in this uh, podcast. Oh, but wait, there's more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hooker, Scott Arden, scored two this day. Oh, great player. No Very good commercial director, don't get me wrong, but a good player. Impossible not to like, like runs... Mm. Marathons of mental health charities, like stop being so likable. Uh, that three Simon Gardner, God. emergency signing player. That 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 is just the definition of Simon Gardner. Um, yeah, I think the less said about Simon Gardner, the better. I'm mm. sure he's a lovely man, but probably he had, he had an okay game. This, this Christ, game. Tom Tom mm. Rowe was clearly very injured. <laughs> yeah, we had um. Both and Mahafufi in our ranks, they were both. Yeah. Um, four, Adam Beard. That's like, oh, yes. Yeah. Let's, not forget, let's not forget what was coming later in the year for Adam Beard. <laughs> Somehow in all of this, Adam Beard was a test liar. Was this, was he just back from injury? Because this was during the Six Nations. This was, a, yeah. a year, you know, four years ago tomorrow. So yeah. this was... What yeah, date February, was this game? Yeah, February 2020. So yeah. It, was, yeah. it might have been so he, the 17th or the 18th, actually, which is eerie close. So he, the Adam Beer timeline, am I right in saying, was he got dropped? But that was that autumn, wasn't it? Was it? No, was it the, no, it the was autumn, autumn coming? It was the autumn after. In yeah, so the autumn of 2020. He oh, got so dropped. Yeah, yeah. he'd come off the bench against Ireland the previous week. For Wales, then sent back to the Ospreys to play yeah. um, that game and a game against Leinster the following week. Because then Toby Booth obviously came in. Mm. When did Toby Booth come in? 
Toby Boots over been... COVID. Similar... Over COVID. So yeah. Similar. Toby. So this yeah, this would have been the last game before COVID, right? We, the penultimate we some... game. Penultimate, penultimate game yeah. before COVID. So then, Toby Booth comes in over COVID. Adam Beard gets dropped. I want to say for the autumn of twenty twenty. Hmm. So did Jones. And then, then has a stormer against Glasgow in January. Was it yesterday? Oh, um, I remember his first game back was against Benetton in St Helens. Um, that was the red card game. Yeah, where. But he dumb. had a, we we played Glasgow at home. I remember he had a really really good game. But anyway, then he got back in the that Six might Nations. The start of the season actually. It might have been. Then he got back in the Six Nations, and then he became a Test lad. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, he had a whirlwind. And let's not forget that what a year before this, he was an integral part of Grand Slam winning team. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Adam Beard, it was in a whirlwind year. Bradley Davis. Just there for vibes at that point. Um, was an integral part of that squad, but he was just there for a fight. Um, mm-hmm. He probably like called Marcel Cutsier a prick before the game in the tunnel and was just hoping he'd punch him. <laughs> <laughs> he's like he's that um, he's that character in Mulan who just always has a black eye. <laughs> That's what Bradley he Davis is, is. Welsh rugby's Begsby. Begsby. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is an athletic back row. Dan Lydia at six. Yes. He's still chopping trees yeah. at this point. Test lion. Yeah. Ollie Cracknell. Um, who, look, he's, look, we got rid of him in good faith. Like, it was not, mm-hmm. you know, Toby Booth didn't see him. And, you know, we see now the type of seven that Toby Booth wants. And he's doing well at Leicester. He suits Leicester's game plan perfectly mm-hmm. well um, when Tommy Rafael isn't there. Um, uh, then you've got Gareth Evans at eight. Oh man, I kind of forget Gareth Evans. G- yeah, in general. Yeah, you know what? You, I don't think you're the only one. So Gareth Evans obviously was. So what I remember with Gareth Evans, right, was that when we signed him, it's because he came from Gloucester, mm. and who obviously England is the best league in the world. Everyone went, "Whoa, now." We've just signed like a world beaten egg from the English Giants of Gloucester. And then he was like, oh, he's okay. <laughs> because it was he, Gareth Delve Mark II, wasn't it? That we signed yeah. this guy that's highly rated at Gloucester at number eight. He came over and was okay. And then he went to Leicester for a bit. And then, yeah. Hey. Yeah, he did. Yeah, it was a short He went to time. Leicester for a year and then retired. Yeah. Oh, well. And then we move on to Alec Davis. Oh, he's going to be oh. important. <laughs> Good player. So Alec Davis Good in player. this game famously charges down the final kick of the game with his face. A winning um, drop goal attempt from Bill Johnston. Winning, from Bill Johnston. Um, and was I, am I right in saying yes? And there was a TMO deliberation over this. Um, no, I remember oh. Marius Matreo was in the middle. Um, Nigel Owens, start. Nigel Owens was running clock actually, and mm-hmm. um, and I think the charge down happens and it bounces off a couple of different players. That's what happens. So Matreya just stops, gives the knock on, and then he realizes, oh wait, that's actually the full time. Like that's the end of the game. It's like no side. That's it. That's done. And then then eventually blows his whistle, but like that three to four seconds where like he just. Giving out all the movements like knock on scrum was like the longest three seconds ever because I'm just waiting for an Ulster penalty because yeah. like, oh. <laughs> and well, then that's the reason I thought they went for the drop goal because they had the penalty. No, I Bill think... Johnson just fancied it. Yeah, I think that's just a match winning attempt by Bill Johnson. I think to be the hero. Oh, Bill Johnston, who is he's a scrum half by trade, by the way, Bill Johnston. Oh, I thought he was a 10. Maybe it's exactly. just maybe an iconic performance here. Yeah. The, the, get him in the island squad. <laughs> um, then, then you've got... So, Alec Davis, right, at the Ospreys. Good player. Really good player. Didn't mm. have the pack to work behind, I think. No. The reason I think he's been so um, good at Saracens is he's had that pack in front of him. Um, and I think it just complements how he plays. 
I always swore by we should have kept him instead of signing Reese Webb. Um, would have suited the way mm. we played better. But then, as much as Reese Webb was bad at times, you can see why Toby was liked him because he played play with an extra flanker. Yeah, he yeah. was the best defensive nine probably in the league. The way he would like shoot off a line out or he blitz like he and because he because he is Reese Webb, mm. he's just so hard to to not be tackled by him. At <laughs> ten. Luke Price. <laughs> Always. Good, um, good opera in the Welsh Premiership. Mm. Years ago, I once saw him with the Ospreys S&C staff in a cafe in the Uplands. Mm. Um, and I was like, oh, that's Luke Price. But I was all like, oh, it's the Ospreys S&C staff. <laughs> and, then, and then I was sat by the window and it's the guy who runs it, Neil, uh, Neil Navarro, who's done some DJ stuff for the Ospreys. He's pretty world famous DJ and stuff but he good mates with all the Ospreys boys and um, then a load of players came in I might be confusing it with another day but I'm going to tell the story anyway and, mm, uh, please. Was, Scott Williams was in there <laughs> and a few of them I want to say Derry Lake was one of the other ones and Scott Williams was really transfixed on his car out front nearly being hit by a bin lorry and he was doing that thing where he should have just said to them, like, lads, wait a sec, I'm just checking to see if this bin lorry hits my car. But he was clearly trying to have a conversation with someone, but also kept looking at the window of his car to potentially hit by a bin lorry. And I was like, right, well, I was just writing him a note, but Scott Williams says, like, undiagnosed ADHD. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's going to the Western Mail tomorrow. Um, yeah, so the, all manner of things happened in that um, cafe. But no. Um, Luke Price. One of those, I think, the most universally noticed in the world's regional rugby example of a player who was overpromoted. Um, was a really good Welsh. I say every time you saw him play in the Welsh Prem, he was really solid. Um, and by all accounts, did well when he moved to France. Um, but just looked slightly off the, you know, off the tempo um, when put into bigger, bigger games of the Ospreys. Um, and I always felt from a bit because it felt like it wasn't his fault. You know, there are some players that got a lot of criticism and you were like, well, you know, whatever. Um, but I always felt a bit like I always felt for Luke Price a great deal. Um, I felt the criticism that came his way was perhaps undeserved. I think, yeah, Price that he picked up, I think it was two seasons in a row where he started in front of Sam Davis in the first game of the season. Mm. And both those times he went off injured. And I think the second one was a really nasty one, which like ruled him out for a year. And you're thinking, you know, if those injuries don't happen, I wonder what would have happened to Luke Price in, in, a, in a way. Yeah. You're thinking, wow, you know, if, so, if some, uh, all right, it was the Alan Clark era, but if someone saw potential of Luke Price to be in the first choice, yeah. class, then without those injuries, what would have happened? They're not saying he would have been like the next Dan Bigger, but would he have been a solid club fly-off operator yeah. without without those injuries? And the never... other interesting thing on that end is when he left Wales, Sam Davis talked about um, being dropped for Luke Price in one of the first couple of games of the season being the big loss of confidence he had at the Ospreys, and he felt his form go down massively because he was dropped and um, Alan Clark didn't give him any feedback on why he dropped him. Um, and when he tried to ask, you know, what have I got to do to get back in the team? Um, he didn't, he didn't get any response and he said he just cracked his confidence. Um, and so it's interesting. Yeah. Cause that kind of backfired on two levels. Um, wanting a different injury and one ending up with, yeah, greatly dropping confidence. Weird era, weird guy, Alan Clark. Yeah. Well, we move on to the Wingers, so Luke Morgan on one wing, who was pretty much a staple around this time anyway. Did he pick up um, a yellow card this evening? I don't think I, I'm that's what I'm checking right now. Um, he did, he, no, he did, he did. He I watched did. the highlights back. Yeah, he gets a yellow card. Oh, he, oh, was that the one in 21? I thought no, no, he doesn't get yellow card. This oh, one. no, I okay. I watched the highlights of two Ulster games back and I'm mixing them up then. No, he um, doesn't get this one. Another um, one also played afterwards. Yeah. He did get it in the most recent one, yeah. At home though, um. So yeah, that that we're we're, we're okay on Luke Morgan the yellow card watch this week. Um, <laughs> Kieran Williams, Owen Watkin, 
that was like the that. first time that centre pairing ever happened. Yeah. And they mm. both played really well. Owen Watkin picking up a try. Kieran Williams made a great line. Kieran Williams made like a 60 metre break immediately from that restart as well. Oh. That was like the first. I, I often wonder why teams kick to Kieran Williams. I, I, it's, yeah, I question this quite a lot because Saracen did it and he just exited rather well in the European match in April. Connor did it and he dropped the ball at the start of the season. Whoops. Yeah, that was the way we started our season. I was like, but the majority sick. but the majority of the time when the ball either heads to him or Morgan Morris, you're thinking, why do they kick to them? Because you're gonna have solid front football to exit regardless of who you're kicking to if you're kicking to that part of the field. My mm. my favourite one with that is there's a bit and I've gifted it, it's still on my profile actually, is the um that weird fifty point scarlet game that we won. Where Scarlett's clearly put a tactic in to kick to Owen Watkin off the, t- off the kickoff because they're like, oh, actually, if we catch it right, he, he either has to pass it and we slow him down in 22 or he has to kick it. But then they just don't chase him and he puts in a really beautiful kick to like yeah. exit and they're like well into the 10 meter line next <laughs> in their half. And I'm like, okay, lads. Uh, hello, Dirksen at 14. God, he must have been, this must have been one of his last games, wouldn't it? Oh, I guess so. I think he had another season or two. I think he was. I think he played in the Toby Booth. No, yeah, he did. But just about. This, no, yeah, because he didn't play, and then he requested a release to go to Nola Gold. Yeah, and yeah. he had a big. There was a clip of like the big ceremony where they announced that everyone gave him a standing ovation, and that was in Toby Booth era. Then yeah, went and played one season in MLR. He played, yeah, he played three matches in that 2020-21 season. And then went and played for Nola. Mm. And wow. played regularly, you know, joined them yeah, 13, early in the season. Games played. For Nola. Yeah. Good on him. What a what a player. What a servant. Love that guy. Hero. Hero. And then fifty Opposite number Claire in his wins. first sorry. sorry, go on, yeah, go on. Opposite number in his first game in um MLR was Dougie Fife. Scotland International. <laughs> <laughs> Good player. Good player. <laughs> With at fullback on his side, former Dragons fullback Carl Mayer. Oh, Carl Mayer. Ooh, good. Yeah. If Mike yeah. Ray didn't exist, it would be called a Carl Mayer. <laughs> <laughs> and then 15 was Kai Evans, who at this point was still not very good. He was mm. a constant string of games on the Osprey side, but he felt like it was a little bit too soon for him to be playing. Like Still not very good in this at this point. Uh, bench is again a mixed bag. Sam Perry, God, can't I can't say more about Sam Perry. He's so good. Look at um, Didn't yeah. score, surprisingly. Rare. Uh, um, Gareth Thomas, items. who let's not forget at this point, Gareth Thomas was fourth choice prop of the Ospreys. Still mm. there. Um, good player. The uh, full time um, photo, the full time like footage, is him fist pumping as the whistle goes. Yeah, on the highlights. by me. Um, 18 is Rugby World Cup 2023 player Georgie Gaijon. Oh, Some of the yeah. biggest shoulders I've ever seen on a man. Oh, God, so Good big. shoulders. Good shoulders. Plays for Stade Montois Rouge, I think now. Yeah. Stade Montois Rouge. Uh... Yeah, Pro Day Dirt at least, where he belongs, to be honest. Yeah, that's, like, that's not an insult. Yeah. That's just like, that is his vibe. He that's gives off good. massive Pro Day Dirt yeah, vibes. This for him as well because <laughs> who wants to start a scrap with that? Let's let's be real. <laughs> Lloyd Ashley at nineteen, who I think just permanently had the nineteen jersey at this point. Yeah, and that's fine because he did a job. He was yeah. really good. Um, Sam Cross st- stepped away from opening Aldi's and uh, graced the bench at this point. Um, Sean Venter, twenty-one, good player. I see. I have a lifelong. Um, what's the word for a relationship in which someone is your nemesis? Because look, to me, Sean Venter is my nemesis because Alan Clark signed him and let Tom Haberfield go, and he is the yeah, reason true. Tom Haberfield <laughs> did not get to play in the Boofy era. Yeah. Purely down to that bloody thing that scrum off he could play on the wing oh i don't yeah. care 
this bloody elderly South African lad who was like, hey, I'll be fantastic at scrum off. And you're like, I don't care. I don't care about you, Sean Venter. Get out of here. Get out of my club. Go off and sign for Montauban where you can be perfectly happy. The best thing about all that is Sean Venter played on the wing when Ospreys went in Leinster as well. Just to like top it off. Yeah. <laughs> That's like perfect. <laughs> Uh, Would that have been his last game? You... Good riddance, uh, I say. Um, he got red card. Oh, no. Is he the red card in the, the Benetton game? Penultimate game. Oh, he played was, in that. That was Gareth Evans that got sent off in the first. That was Evans, yes. Uh, no, he penultimate... scored in that Benetton game. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He did, yeah. Came off an inside ball from uh, Kieran Williams, I believe. Uh, Tian Thomas Wheeler, 22. Uh, good, good player. Good player. Good player. Never quite Ball hit his baby, potential. Beat, beat the baby blacks. Look, I love Tian. I played rugby with Tian growing up. Oh, well. Um, we, we played together at Chabanos. Um, mm. Really, really good guy. Good, like, really good player. Never worked out really for him at the Ospreys. There was that he, bit just before he went to Japan where he yeah. looked really good. And there was that game against Zebra. And I was like, oh, my God, where's this yeah. been? That and, was it. Yeah. You felt like he was finally starting to live on the huge potential he had right when, you know, budget and squad size and everything else. And if you know, if it was the equivalent of Scottish or Irish region, those budgets, he'd still be here and he'd be, have a chance to kick on. As he is, he is having that, but having it in Japan, which is a shame because yeah. it's finally starting to really look like the, the proper quality player that we all knew he could be from the flashes we got. And then, um, Robbie, I'm sorry, but James Hook was at 23. <laughs> the nemesis bench. <laughs> Here it is. All my nemesises on one bench and Lloyd this Ashley was, final, was all right. This was his final season um, <laughs> yeah. where he played seven matches in the league and uh, two Champions Cup games. This is the only game he won all season. Oh, um, he, he scored against Saris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Did, that yeah. was days before my James Hook story, my infamous James Hook story that I think I've alluded to on this podcast and not, I've told it elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, um, you told, yeah. Yeah, just quite the, that it was days before that I travelled down to London and seen them get battered by Saracens with him at 10. Um, 44-3. Ooh. So yeah, that was Osprey's 26, also 24. Uh, no bonus points for the Ospreys, but losing bonus point for Ulster. Um, Ulster remained third in the league uh, after this. Ospreys, I think, moved up to 13th instead of 14th because the Kings oh. got battered from 60 points, as as was the... Well, but we couldn't talk because we lost to the Kings in the November before. So, you know, in a team that contained Alan Wynne-Jones, which I assume he personally went and punched everyone involved. No, that, that was <laughs> World Cup, I, I think it was probably after World Cup. I, AWG only came back for like the Saracens. Game. Oh, okay. Yeah. Even worse. That's worse. <laughs> so, um, that, yeah, that was Osprey's Ulster. Let's talk about Osprey's Ulster okay. again. Okay. Well, 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 hold on. Go on. There's two things I want to, three things I want to add, right? One, the inspirational team talk that Alan Clark gave before this game that has lived with me forever since. I want to play you a clip of him in the press conference beforehand, or the, the okay. TV interview beforehand. Always stayed with me this, and I had to dig it out. How's it going to be funded or not at this stage? Uh, that's way above me, but I can tell you that the Ospreys exists, and, you know, you look at the calibre. His, his pre-match interview, he told us that the Ospreys exist. Did you hear that? Did that come through? Yeah, right? the Ospreys yeah. exist. The Ospreys exist, and... I can tell you that the Ospreys <laughs> exists. I'm glad he got one <laughs> thing right during his reign. <laughs> Never forgotten his like inspirational. What do you think of this weekend? Well, you know what? The club's here. The club exists. Good on him. Um, right. As per the other week, top of the film and uh, single chance this week oh, in yeah. February 2020. Right to set a picture. Um, Blinding lights by the weekend was number one in the singles charts. Good song. Which, yeah, good on them. Number one in the film charts, though, the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. Oh, good film. Which it's the only time I've ever been to the cinema drunk. <laughs> I feel like if you went sober, you would have felt drunk as well. So I don't <laughs> think it 
James Marsden like talking to a CGI <laughs> blue abomination for two hours. This is my the, type of movie. I went with my my friend at the time who were you, you know we had a separate falling out because how they treat their part. That's a whole separate thing. But um, they he suggested the idea of us having three pints before seeing Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, he then arrived late. And we ended up having to down three pints in 15 minutes before going to see Sonic the Hedgehog because we committed to this. Um, maybe it was about 20 minutes. But it was a, it was a whole afternoon. Whole afternoon, that. Um, it was over half term as well, so the screening was full of kids. Um, anyway, that's enough That's enough about Ospreys vs. Ulster. Let's talk I'm sorry I do this. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. Because I've been reminded of Sonic the Hedgehog now. And Jim, uh, Jim Carrey's, quite frankly, brilliant performance. <laughs> Career defining. Um, I, I I am checking what was on TV that day. Oh, I feel like this is always a good thing, but it's not showing up for me. I'm quite annoyed. Come on, uh, this was the only event on TV for me. You know, this was the yeah, the... true. Right, I'll come back to that. I will come back. So let's talk about uh, the Ulster game because I mm. think this. Uh, so going into this game, Osprey sit in eighth place in the league. Uh, we've won five, lost four, uh, sitting on twenty five points, which is exactly what. Well, I don't think anyone really predicted us to be on this. I certainly mm. didn't. I said this on Twitter. I expected us to be maybe around the fifteen points at this mark. Maybe, maybe I was underselling us a bit. So we sit on 25 points. Ulster sit in fifth uh, on 28 points. They've won six, lost three. But they've come off a, quite frankly, terrible run in Europe. Mm. Um, in Boosie Bingo earlier, it, it was revealed that back this weekend for the Ospreys, all, who are available to be selected, is Morgan Morse. Who yeah. we knew anyway because of Yeston. Thank you, Yeston. Um, uh, Alex Cuthbert. Uh, so he's clearly stepping away from the media for a bit. He's now ready to, and he's been raring to go, to be fair to him. In every interview, he said, he's like, I just want to get back out on the pitch. Mm. Um, who, lest we forget, before his injury, was playing some bloody good rugby as well. Um, Especially for the Ospreys, just yeah. pointing that out. Toby Fricker. Um, yeah. Who? Yeah. Good to see. Like, he, but just like he played that one game, I think against Sharks, and, and didn't set the world on fire. But it's good to have the numbers back, is what we, I think the and have that depth at wing. Uh, Nicky Smith, hugely um, important. Hugely important. Takes the weight off Garen Phillips. I didn't even know if Garen's sort of available. Cameron Jones, no, not that one. Um, again, taking the weight off him. Mm. Uh, so mm. having having that available, Ulster have got a handful of players, obviously still with Ireland. Um, yeah, but the player they do have available for them is Stephen Kitsoff. So, you know, having having an international standard loose head is going to come in handy. Yeah, um, and the last time we played Stephen Kitsoff, by the way, we were screwed out of so many penalties by the referee at that storm this game. Uh, is the one we drew. Yes, oh, do you remember that? Yeah, yeah yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. jogged in yes, mind, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, was like, yes. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I'm not saying it was Andrea Piardi, but it might well be Andrea Piardi. 16 all draw in a horrendous uh, night in Swansea in terms yeah. of weather conditions. Um, ironically, the first try score was Paul DeWet, the Stormers scrum half. <laughs> yeah, Paul DeWet. <laughs> then the Ospreys scored from a mall, which was like. Normal. Dewey Lake Mall, yeah. I think Scott Baldwin might have scored, actually. Oh, was it Scott Baldwin? Oh, he was Scott Baldwin, you're right, yeah. And then Stephen Myler wallops a touchdown conversion from nowhere to level the scores before the Ospreys try and go on in the attack on the last play. Reese Henry makes half a break, which kind of does. ignited everyone before Owen Watkin drops the ball, like the, 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 the next pass, and then it ends in a draw. I definitely want to say it was Andrea Piardi because if we weren't getting scrum penalties, it was definitely Andrea Piardi. Yeah, <laughs> he, I, I'm pretty certain it was as well. Ro- Robbie talks about Sean Vinter being his nemesis. Andrea Piardi is my nemesis. 
um, because every time I see him, I'm filled with like rage and and the the want to, to hurt bald people, despite well, well, you know, <laughs> sitting next to a bald person for eighty minutes. Well, he is in Wales this weekend, but good news for you, is James, he's at the Cardiff Con again. I hope his train gets delayed. Um, <laughs> it's a nightmare getting Mar- out. Gets caught Don in one Mar- of those bloody railing hells they have at Cardiff Central on international days. But you don't want him to be that late, just in case they reschedule it for him to be in the Sunday fix. This, this, is, <laughs> this is why I should have taken my chance at Poison Frank Murphy's coffee when I saw him at coffee number one in Swansea before... Um, uh, uh, a Champions Cup match, or it was a Champions Cup match actually. I'm pretty sure it was either it was definitely where I was like, Oh, it's Frank Murphy. Hmm. Oh, I have a chance to do something. <laughs> um, Don Morris is back as well, which is really good hmm. actually because it we would be potentially lining up with Ivani Boshoff, who's obviously debutant at 13. Um, so that's nice. And then El Cap, Justin Tipperick is back. Um, He's stopped talking to Ben Youngs now. Um, weirdly, on two separate two of his podcasts, um, there is a great clip going around that yesterday put me on to of uh, Justin Tipperick talking about Dan Cole, and he calls him the Godfather of cheats, and then goes into detail about how Dan Cole pin him in a rut, and Tipperick looking up and just seeing a shiny bald head, which I, I absolutely love because I cannot picture Dan Cole doing anything like bad. But him just pinning you down and you're being blinded by some bald head. Um, but yeah, tips is back. So that is just just from like a and both said it in the thing in the interview, is when you lose players like Beardy, North, Gatom, you're not just losing, you know, Lions players and Wales players, mm. you're losing leadership and linchpins of a squad. And when you've not got Morgan Morris and Reese Davis, Morgan Morris especially being you know, captain for large parts of the season, you do lack a bit of leadership sometimes. And I, you know, that was evident a bit in South Africa, probably, with, you know, Adam Beard went out and led very well. But if Adam Beard wasn't there, who steps in the captain? Do you know what I mean? So there, there is to say that. So you've got Cuthbert coming back in, who's not necessarily because he's not played that many, but he's a leader in terms of how experienced he is. Tipperick has obviously been there, done it. He's done it all. He is Mr. Osprey. He's behind Alwyn Jones in my eyes. Um, so he, you know, Nicky as well mm. has been around since, what, 2013? Um, captain quite a few times. Captain quite a few times, yeah. Um, you know, I, but then to feed into the guys around like Morgan Morse, like your Frickers, like your Don Morris's, do you know what I mean? So just having mm. them linchpins. Um, it, it is really, really good. Um, and I expect to see pr- maybe except Toby Fricker. I expect mm. to see them all involved. Um, yeah. Which is just a huge boost when you're going against, like, I completely forgot Kits off as a thing. Um, but yeah. it makes me feel better when you have, it made me feel better that Tom Boat will be going against Kits off, but when you have Nicky on his other prop inside you're like yes right it reminded mm. me a bit when I was quite scared in that Leinster game we had where Al Alatoa backwards and mm. up in the air I was like oh Al Alatoa he's like we could struggle a bit of scrum time here because we've got the, the bit of a lightweight pack behind I was like oh no no it's fine Nicky's here <laughs> he's just put Al Alatoa in a suplex I, w- I wonder um, who's in the middle for that evening's game <laughs> um on to Ulster. So they mm. have uh, had some players released. Um, sorry, I have to scroll back to the tweets. Um, Jacob Stockdale, Ian Henderson, Nick Timoney and Tom Stewart are all training with the province and uh, head coach Dan McFarland's disposal. Stuart McCloskey and Tom O'Toole will not feature. So Stuart McCloskey clearly shitting out, doesn't want a big game of the year. Um, Tom O'Toole, I'm quite happy he's not playing as well. Nick Timoney could have been difficult to play against. Mm. The big one for me is Ian Henderson and Jacob yeah. Stockdale. But uh, Henderson, Henderson in particular. Yeah. Henderson's the, the big name there. A year ago, he would have been a regular in the Irish squad and there's no chance we would have yeah. seen him here. 
but obviously Joe McCarthy's emergence has meant he's dropped on the pecking order and suddenly he's being released for this game and it's a real chance for him to prove something. Yeah. Um, he is probably the player, if you look at the likely Ulster team or a likely Ulster team, I'd be most worried about. Um, when you look at their kind of press conference, um, they, I mean, so they didn't send um, Dan McFarlane, the main head coach, out. Instead, they sent out assistant coach Dan Soper, which to me, to use the common parlance of amateur rugby, they don't want it. They don't want it. They're not sending the head coach out. You know, they're not interested. They're only sending the yeah. assistant out. But he did mention um, they're going to look at a lot of academy players and they perform really well for them this year. And it's a good chance for them. So there's a chance we may see a younger Ulster team. But also they've got a very strong team available to them. Yeah, this is this is what worries me. And else, this is... You look at the table and we've said the URC table from... Mm, I'll count Cardiff in this because they are on 21 points, but between third, between fourth and and tenth or eleventh, there's six points. Yeah, like that's mental. That's now like the URC has been slated a bit, and probably a bit rightly so, being a bit one sided a lot. Um, you know, like Lens have gone on big unbeaten runs and things like that, but actually this year. You know, there's only ten points between ninth and first. Do you know what I mean? Or eleventh mm. and first even. So that's two wins. Do you know that that's yeah. So but I spent, the squad go on, Robert. No, I spent half an hour the other day, um, because you know, the back into URC season, it's one of my favorite things to do and haven't had a chance to do it for a long time. Uh comparing last season's table from this time last year to the current table to the table from the end of various years to see if there's any trends you can pick up on in terms of you know what they need how this may play out etc there's nothing you can work out but the one thing that does stand out is how tight it is between the top and as you say down to about 11th or 12th um where you've got a drop off at the bottom but still those teams at the bottom you know the three teams at the bottom um have won collectively more games you know each of them have won about the same number of games that the teams um at the bottom three had you know between them last year so it's all yeah it's really tight the league's really tight this year and that may help us out in the long run i'm just reading them elster notes now because they handily put out notes mm. uh, the full interview in text form um so yeah they're definitely uh one to watch like because they could bring a load of academy lads, but then still bring like John Cooney, Dave Ewers, Nathan Doak, who scares me a lot, Billy Burns. Like so, I I I think we'll see. I think if you looked, if you're a casual and looked at the Ulster team, mm-hmm. if you if you knew rugby enough to know that Ulster have the likes of Ian Henderson, McCloskey, Stockdale, Kitsoff, and all that, you think, oh, this is not a scary team. But then you actually, if you're a rugby nerd, you're like. Shit, they've got John Cooney, Nathan Doak, Billy Burns, Dave Ewers, you know. Alan O'Connor playing his 802nd Con- game. Yeah, 802nd game. Um, yeah, mm. we'll see. We'll see. They can still Do put out wanna... a team of primarily internationals and very seasoned, you know, European Cup standard players. So it's scary. It's, it's a scary, scary thought. Do and yes, they had a bad run in Europe, but like they beat Leinster away the week before yeah. that, so they're capable of big things. Do we want to have a go at predicting our squad for the weekend? Mm. So I will. I have got my handy dandy notebook. So what I will ask you is the player, and I will do one for each of us. Um, yes, yeah, so let's start with you. Let's start with loose head. Um. Yeah, I think it was if he's fit, and obviously Toby Booth mentioned it. So Nicky Smith at loose head, I think, is the only, well, one of the only answers he can really give. Are we all in? Nicky completely, Smith? completely. Yeah. Nicky Smith times three, <laughs> and if we do, I want to sort of revert back to type and play that forwards orientated game. Nicky would be very important to that. Mm. Uh, Hooker. It's only one man, surely, for all three picking Robbie. Yeah, Sam Parry slides yeah. in, sits there. 
if they're injured, you know, safe bet, like, safe pair of hands. I feel like the front row is the really easy part of the score. Yeah. <laughs> and then Tom Boat at three. Yep. Apologies to Big Sexy, but. Yeah, sorry, White Chocolate. <laughs> Not today. Um, the second row gets interesting. Hmm. This is where it gets tricky and it all starts so to kind of feed in let's together. Let's start with you, Robbie. Okay. Um, I think, well, I think there's a very decent chance James Ratty has to move up from the back row into the second row. Um, with Reece Davis not returning in time, Fender injured. It starts to get a bit thin. So I think James Ratty comes in from one of the second rows. So Ratty in a four. And then who's your who's partnering him? Is it Victor? Me, yes. Uh, yeah, then I think you're looking at um, yeah. Victor Sakete. Sakete? Yeah. Um, yeah. Victor Sakete. Partnering him. There's a difficulty. He's been in a week. Can he run lineup calls and so on in time? But also, you know, he's a very well established player. He's been around a long time. Um, mm-hmm. Played at high level, you know. Hopefully he can pick it up in time. Yep. Yes, Tim? Yeah, I'm in agreement. I think it would probably be a bit too soon for Lewis Jones to be starting. Mm. Uh, big URC game like this and potentially calling out the line now. Um, hmm. nothing, nothing against Lewis Jones, but I think he's probably a smidge too soon. Cool. I'm, I'm absolutely in agreement as well. We said in the group chat that uh, Ratty, if Reese Davis wasn't available, then um, we'd be seeing Ratty Victor Back row gets a bit spicy. Yes, then talk me through your back row. Ooh, um, I have got Justin Tiprick at six, Harry Deems at seven, and then Will Hickey at eight. Mm-hmm. Unless I've missed someone glaringly obvious. Uh, your actual mate? Uh, <laughs> I've listened to Toby Booth and... Um, I yeah, think I, I, really I think that. he's quite right in what he said in terms of you know managing game loads because he is still really really young, and even though it was his nineteenth birthday a month ago, he's uh, still got a bit of uh, development to do. So don't really want to start him after two <laughs> big performances in the twenties. Hmm. Uh, Robbie, talk me through your back row. Yeah, no, I think similar. I think there's a chance you could put Tristan Davis at six to give you more of a traditional six because um, that's three kind of sevens by choice. Um, so you may balance that out and move either, you know, have either Hickey or um, Tipperick play eight with Dave, uh, Tristan Davis at six. Um, there's a chance that Rudolph comes in straight at eight, you know, as a primarily a eight by preference. Um, but you worry about having potentially three players in the, you know, in the potential of the starting team, um, but at least two players in the pack who have been in a week and the kind of cohesion that could bring. So probably safest, yeah. Um, Tipperick, Hickey or Deves, and um, Tristan Davis. Right, I need definite predictions. Okay, Tristan Davis, uh, was- Justin Tipperick, and Hickey's probably the best option at eight. Interesting. I think if that does happen, by the way, Tipperick will go in at eight at scrums. Yeah. As he's done many, many times before. Okay. I am going to be bold and say it's going to be Tipperick at six, Rudolph at eight, and um, Deves at seven. And one of them, their only job is to. Hit day viewers. <laughs> That's their only job. How good is Arsenal? You can't miss. Pretty much. Okay, then we go into nine. Uh, yes, then you start me off. I think it's going to be Ruben Morgan Williams. I think. Yeah. Unless he's injured mysteriously, I think he'll start again. I think he's having a quietly good season as well. Yeah, not if you're on the Arsenal fan agreed. forum. Um, no, completely agreed. Completely Robbie, agreed. Robbie, you're in agreement, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
I am going to say Luke is going to start. Okay. I, I don't know why. I just think he will. Uh, 10 is an interesting one. Mm. What are we saying? I think my previous instinct was Jack Walsh, but the more I think about it, the more I think this is a Dan Edwards game to That's be a bit calmer and see if Walsh comes on and maybe can change things later on. So I think I'd go for Dan Edwards as a starter. Yes, then? I'll go Walsh to be different. I think You'll go Walsh. Yeah. It's got a Dan Edwards drop goal to win it written all over it. Dan Edwards. I'm going to go... Mischarged down by John Cooney with his I'm face. Gonna go Don, I'm going to go Dan Edwards as well. I, I But I would not be surprised if he starts Walsh, and I wouldn't complain either. No, no agreed. Uh, wingers. Talk to me about wingers. Let's start with left wing. I think Keelan Giles holds his yeah. place, stays in. Are we all you not... in agreement? Giles gets one nod in the wing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Keelan Giles times three. Uh, 14, what are we saying? I would go with Cuthbert, I think, personally. Um, give him a run, providing he's you know all good to play most of the game. I'd start Alex Cuthbert. Yeah, if he's fit to play, then there's, you know, if you look at the two wins a couple of years ago against Munster and Ulster, mm. I thought, I, he, all right, he didn't score, but Cuthbert was quietly excellent. Yeah. Especially in like defence and, you know, under the high ball. So, yeah. He, yeah, he was brilliant. He really impressed me in that Munster game in his just how he aligns the defence from the wing. And I was always taught, he's always talking to the assistant referee as well. Hmm. And I'm really excited to see how he can fit into this Mark Jones defensive system because he feels like he could be a perfect option within that. Um, yes. Because we haven't really seen him play in a defensive system where he's applying a lot of pressure from the wing. And I know in past he's perhaps been criticised a lot for defensive whatever. He's a really, really coachable player and he's always overcome that sort of thing really quickly, I found. Mm. Um, and I'll be really excited by the thought of that. And you know, having that extra leadership in the team helps. Um, you mentioned James earlier, like every interview he's been doing since, you know, the world cup in sort of September, he's been talking about how eager he is to get back playing. That is a guy that's going to give you 110%, you know, and you may need that mm. in a game of this. I know it's the break week in the six nations, but like from an Oscar's perspective, this is huge. So yeah. Yeah. Um, centers. So I think 12 is pretty self-explanatory, right? Uh, who else? Yeah. Right. James Hook is playing 12. <laughs> um, Sean Venter at 13. <laughs> yeah, Sean Venter at 13. <laughs> um, 13 is where it gets maybe a bit complicated. Mm, Andrea Piardi at no. 13. <laughs> yeah. I am going to say that Boshoff starts Ooh. because Don Morris can cover more positions. So it makes sense for... Mo- but now I'm saying it, Don Morris should start and Boshoff <laughs> comes on and Don Morris can move around. So I'm going to say Morris starts. Are hmm. you in agreement? Yeah. I would want, considering how led from 13 this Mark Jones defensive system is, I would want someone who has been in the environment and knows it, even if they're not played that many games, yeah. leading the defence. Yeah, yes, Don Morris for me. Yeah, I agree. As much as I really would love to see Luke Scully at 13 again. Oh, yes. <laughs> Morris. Test level 13. <laughs> um, was very good in that Zebra game. Yeah. Where, where he got injured. And then you had that weird moment where Morris got it off to Morris. <laughs> he thought it felt like if this was on Sky Sports, he would have had an aneurysm. Oh. <laughs> well, Morris, he's got it off to Morris. What? <laughs> Um, and then 15, are we saying the Ginger Prince? Oh, who else? Who else? Hopkins. Yeah, with injuries, it's kind of him or Provera, isn't it? So, uh, yes, see, Hopkins, continue to fall back. I think we could see Provero, but I'm going to say Hopkins. Mm. Yes, Dave? Um, I think it would be yes and Hopkins, because if I've picked Walsh at 10... It would be chaos with the brother at the back as well. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll have a, a little bit of uh, steadiness somewhere. So let's quickly go through the bench then. Ethan Lewis. Yeah. 
Uh, Reese Henry for loose head. I'd have Gary Phillips as a loose head. Is he is he available? Ooh. Uh, or was he not? Was he injured? He didn't play against uh, uh, the Lions, if you remember. Oh, of course he didn't. Of course, yeah. Um, so yeah, in that case, you know, well, I think Reese Henry is one of the two props, and then depending on fitness, either Garen Phillips or Ben Warren. So I'm going to say Henry. Mm. I'll, I'll stick with. It. I'll stick Henry who said as well. If with that... a with a star next to it to know mm. that this is the very wrong Garen, and then if that means Warren at eighteen, yeah, second row would be I'm going to say Jones. Mm-hmm. But then I'm also going to slap Regan Ooh, yeah. there as well. Would that be his first game back? Awesome. It would. Uh, he played for the Whites, but yeah. Yeah, first off awesome his game back. Um, 20, are we saying tr- uh, Morse? Um, equally, yeah, Morse or Rudolph. Or Rudolph. Equally, Tristan Davis could wear 19, but I think he'd want yeah. to a second row. Um, 21 is either Luke or Ruben. Yeah, the other one. Um, yeah, or you could say Cameron. Um, but I think more likely it's going to be the whichever one doesn't start. Yeah. 22 is going to be Scully. No, it will be Walsh or Edwards. Walsh, yeah. So let's just say Walsh. Um, I know for Edwards because I know. Yes, then chose Walsh. And then 23 could be Boshoff, could be Fricker, could, could be, be Brother. Could be Brother. I'm going to say Brother is the most likely. Mm. Yes, then, Boshoff Rodri strikes me as. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, then has Rodri been released to go back? I don't think he has. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay, sorry, Robbie. Go on. No, just Bosch off strikes me as someone who could make an impact off the bench, who could come on and cause a bit of chaos. So I, I think that's a possibility. Um, but he doesn't have the versatility. No. Which leads me to believe that if Bosch off's going to play, he'll start. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Because he's he's a thirteen directly. Yeah. So or you I'm want gonna... Provo in the team to slide around. Already. Yeah, I'm going to go, right, the front row is, we're all unanimous in, actually, the front five are all unanimous. In Nicky, Sam, Perry, and Tom Bota, uh, Ratty and Victor Sekete, or Sekete, whatever, Victor. Um, then we're Tipic. looking really at, we've all chosen Tipperick, we've all chosen Debs. Uh, it could be Hickey, it could be Rudolph, Tristan Davis. Nine, we're looking at Ruben or Luke. Mm. Ten, Walsh or Dan. Uh, Twelve is unanimous in Keith. Thirteen, unanimous in Morris. Fourteen, Cuthbert. Eleven, Giles. Fifteen, Hopkins. That's a that's a team that can win. Yeah, it's a proper I, find a way team, isn't it? It is. Nope. I was. Gonna I will say, drop the pitch, but find, find a way. A way. The limitations of it, I think, ball carrying, you're relying a lot on your um, Keefs to get over your gain lines. Mm. Um, actually, where you probably find more success carrying in that team is out, is out wide. And I think if you're mm. playing that, you bring in, that's where Dan Edwards maybe makes that. He can, uh, Dan Edwards will get the ball... Um, across the line quicker, Walsh will make that half break and offload. That that's where your two tens are looking. There, Luke Davis will play that ball quicker. Ruben will kick you into space and kick you to compete. Again, Tipperick operates in that wide channel. Deves will carry. We know this. Um, if you play a Rudolph, I think you look at him as a primary ball carrier. Um, you look him to lead the lead the sleigh. Yeah, James Ratty. Lead the pack. Yeah, James Ratty is is a ball carrier. Um, 
you yeah, look at him to lead the other Wind of the Willows characters. Lead the other Wind of the Willows characters. I um, I'm sorry. You you've got second rows. You, well, you've got a line of operating team, I think. If in mm. in that team, because you got Tipper, who's been who was Wales's main source of lineup all for years. Um, Victor Secretete is, is, you know, Cheetah's captain goes up the lineup. Uh, Rudolph is a lineup forward as well. Mm. Um, Deves, I, I, have we seen Deves jump? I don't think I've ever seen Deves jump a couple of times. Yeah, he's not a regular. He's kind of a tail jumper rather than a. Yeah, so there's a, there's, um, there's lineup forwards okay. there to set up the driving mall. I think another part why I'd look at Tristan Davis. Just an actual line. Uh, yeah, option. that's why. You, yeah, maybe look at Tristan for that. Um, obviously, we know about the scrummage and prowess of it. I think having Victor in them adds that bit of bulk as well that we're probably missing. I think mm. if we go with that Tipperick, Deves, Hickey back row, it's quite a lightweight back row on the face of it. I know Deves is a hard hitter, as is Hickey, but it is a very lightweight back row in that mm. sense. So I think having that bit of extra bulk. Again, that's where you could bring a Tristan D- a Davis in. Um, yeah, and it's just about, you know, it's just about where the boys are at in terms of mindset. Mm. You know, we had, we had this conversation pre-Lions and we were like, oh, if we could just have a good performance or something like that. But we know this team can pull it out of the bag. Yeah. We the know. really interesting thing about reading the Ulster Press stuff is how negative it is. And how much of it yeah. is about their poor performances leading into the international break. And a lot of the players, you know, Marty Moore um, and Dave McGann, both talking an awful lot about how they spent a lot of time really bollocking themselves for how they played and, you know, really being um, tough on themselves. And Martin, Marty Moore talks about, again, they don't want it. Uh, talks about how he doesn't feel low in confidence, but he gets why people would look at him, how he's playing and feel that way. Um, and there's a few things where you look at it and you're like, there's, they don't seem particularly um, overjoyed to be back in the way that hearing Toby Booth talk, you know, they seemed, obviously we're going off one one guy who's very good at talking to the press rather than, you know, a range of players, but the vibe around the Osprey seems much more positive. Um and you could see that as Ulster need this. You could see it as perhaps they're staring down the barrel a bit. I don't know. I'm anxious and excited um, and eager for Sunday to roll around. I'm a big fan of what he said about what he he views the away days the Ospreys are, yeah. where he says it's attritional, low scoring. Um, hopefully this weekend is different. When I think back to other games, it's a tough day. One that has always relied upon set piece and territory, mm. which... Pre this season, I absolutely would agree with you, and I would have said there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. Um, but now knowing the way we can play with the fossil attack, in the sense of that offloading game, that you know, looking at tired shoulders, getting that half break for the offload, you know, the way Giles attacks wing lazy defenders and wingers, you know, the the added presence of a Tipperick in there in terms of what he can bring with his hands. Um, you know, I think back to that, I not the wonder Montpellier tried, but the one where he puts in Cuthbert for his second. Yeah. Um, with the way he comes into the line for that, that's what you that's what you get with um a tipper gun. Maybe what we've lost with Watkin in that regards you can bring back in with a Morris and a tipper. Um yes how 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 do you feel that the game's gonna go? I think it's going to be, well, like many other sides, you know, they, they can really say what they want about team selection and things like that, but you normally tend to see a good Elster side come down to Swansea. Um, even when they ended up on the losing side, you're thinking that they're still a good side, you know. I'm fully awaiting Robert Balakum to pop up and score a couple of tries here and there. And it, it's going to be tough, but with recent results and you know, some big players coming back in, you know, players that you'd probably expect in the first, you know, if the Osprey power their strongest side, you'd probably expect those three to start. I think it's going to be a really interesting game in terms of just whatever goes on. Um, I think set piece is going to be huge. I think the battle between both there and Kitschoff is probably the one to watch up front. Um 
hopefully aided by the rest of the pack. And I don't know how I don't know how it's going to go in terms of a prediction because you think, despite their two European losses, you know, Ulster one of their games was against Toulouse and you know Toulouse are Toulouse for crying out loud. They've got Antoine Dupont. Well, now they don't, but they used to have Antoine Dupont. Like he is a very good rugby player, and you you, <laughs> think, you just think well, I don't really want to ignore that because Toulouse, Toulouse put 40-odd points on them. But the week before, they win in Leinster. And you think, hmm. ah, right, that might be an issue. But the, the way that the Ospreys have done over the last few weeks, I hope they can sneak it. And I think, I do think Ulster might nick it by a score, sadly. Ooh. I'm not, I'm not sure. I think I, Ospreys go into this game favourites, and I think we can genuinely put the forwards in mm. to win this. I think it's not necessarily a bonus point um, win, but I think if we consistently keep the scoreboard ticking over or applying that pressure and not letting... So we were talked about in the press conference, they start really well. You nullify that. They I don't see Ulster getting that momentum. Mm. They kick they kick a lot off nine. Um if you look at the way their two nine set up in John Cooney and Nathan Doak, both brilliant to the box kick. Um Billy Burns has got a, a weapon of a boot on him. And and then they, they sort of do play a bit like the Ospreys in that respect of they want you to make the mistake so they can scrum you. You know, so I, I, I but I see this, if we nullify that start and have them defensive sets that we know we can have because we've done it and keep that penalty count low, there there's you know, we we, we are favourites. That's not we are favourites for this game. I I think the squad's come. This Osprey squad's come an awfully long way since that Glasgow game at the start of the season. Um, who are a reasonably similar team to Ulster in terms of the pack they can put out, in terms of where their biggest threats are. You know, largely being out wide and that scrum mall. Um, and what we saw in that game was a team good enough to win it that couldn't close it out. And over the course of the season since, they've learned to close those games out and learned how to be very careful and are tactically so much more astute and the players are making better decisions in the later stages and are really getting used to the habit of winning, which is the most important skill in rugby is knowing yeah. how to win a game, you know, which is kind of a, which is a habit and a big part of it. Um, and we're starting to see that develop. And that I think is the big test in this game is how far they come. Um, can they do it when it's not a surprise if they win and then not against another Welsh side where they're perhaps more evenly matched um this is this this is big this these three games over the international period this edinburgh away and then Munster home the week after the six nations finishes when most of the players from the six nations probably be rested still could potentially be season defining and could be the keys in getting us towards the playoffs yeah so again you know i would have the ospreys as favorites but then when we did the teams named there's i feel there's a very good chance i'll look at the Ulster team and go uh, okay, maybe not. Yeah, maybe that, you know, maybe we I should feel. be looking at Ulster as as the favourites. So I've got two things. I I, I don't want to um, you know uh, piss on anyone's chips, but Alan O'Connor is unavailable for the game with an ankle injury, as is Kieran Ooh. Treadwell. Um, oh, you know, they don't want so it. They don't want it. They don't want it. Yeah, Rob Heron's also out, uh, and Stuart Moore as well are the other notable ones I can see on their injury list. Okay. Um, Let's give me a prediction then, boys. I need, I need a score prediction from you. Bear um, in mind, we have not seen team sheets. Tough. Uh, I hate this. My gut tells my gut is looking in Osprey's win. I hate to say that out loud by you know a couple of points. Um, perhaps slightly higher scoring than Marty Moore is expecting, but not that high scoring. Um, but saying that out loud now, I feel like I've jinxed it. I feel like I've ruined it. Um, so also by 61. 
<laughs> no, I hate that now. I hate that now. I put that out there. No, I. <laughs> no, okay. I, I, yeah, I want to say Ospreys by like five. Okay, Ospreys by five. Yes, then. You stick with three. your on field decision. I, yeah, I, th- I think, I think, um, yeah, that's. I'll look at the teams on Friday. I think, yeah, they might win, and I, I think they will. I think that you know Tom Stewart scores off every rule and more possible. So, um. You know, he's like he's like an Irish Johnny Matthews in the way, but, <laughs> but yeah, I think I think they'll pinch it. It'd be like quite a quite a high scoring game, something like 25, 22 to Ulster, something like that. I am gonna say I'm gonna stick my prediction from the rap and say Ospreys by eight. And I hate myself for saying it, but I do awesome. but I will f- I, when the team sheet comes out on Friday, I'll feel a bit more well, hopefully for the same, I'll feel more um I feel more confident in either decision. Other than that, gents, I think that's it for tonight. We've been rambling mm. enough. It's nice to have some actual rugby to talk about. Um, you can find us all on the usual socials at Squidge Rugby at yes underscore Thomas21 and at Osprey's Irie on X. Uh, yeah, we'll see you yeah. next week. Oh, go on, yeah. Robbie, please, no please, one. no, please go and watch uh, Games People Play from t- 2020 on Viaplay. It is 153 minutes long and an ensemble comedy about a group of old friends in their 30s regressing to their teenage selves over a long weekend. I had never heard this film until about two minutes ago. Um, a, a Finnish comedy from four years ago. Um, Age 12 years and up, rated 6.9 on IMDb. I know what I'm doing this evening. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, I won't be watching that. But, uh, <laughs> what, yeah, <laughs> you can find this all on the regular stuff. Um, I'm going to go and do some digging about... Um, I'm going to message some Ulster people about what squad they're likely to bring. We yeah. probably should have done beforehand. Um but who makes notes? I can play Baldur's Gate 3 instead. Um, you can find me every, well, it would be Tuesday for you, but every Monday night on the Rap Podcast, uh, spouting bollocks about the Ospreys, defending our honour, if I'm quite honest. Um, yeah. Brilliant. I think that's it for tonight, folks. Uh, you can get us on all the usual podcast stuff. Uh, we will see you next week where we will review the Ulster game Yay! Or, damn it, Mr. Italian Referee, why didn't Mm. you give us that penalty? Um, And then we will look ahead to the Ospreys' involvement in the Island game uh, and preview... Well, what are we doing for good player next week? Have we decided yet? We'll we'll work that out. We'll work that out. Okay, I've got some ideas already. I've got some ideas. Um, Yeah, we're going to talk about that now. Um, Right, we'll see you next week. Have a good one, everyone. Bye now. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Osprey's Ari podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Please subscribe, rate and review wherever you listen to us as it really helps spread the word. You can find us on all the usual social media channels or email us on welshregionalrugbypod at gmail.com. And remember... Whatever the question, rugby is always the answer. Sports Social Podcast Network.